Sometimes you have to. This is Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church Bible study recorded on Saturday and broadcast on Sunday at trinitydelray.org. So, uh, so we're going to uh, share the screen and uh, there we go. Now, when I'm in share screen, we'd, I don't see all of your faces. So that, that's what we have this morning. And the expectation that God has laid before us this morning is to look at 1 Kings chapter 2, beginning with verse 22. And on these weeks of Bible study, if you bring your Bibles um, uh, to, the, to your computer or phone and need to look up something uh, for us, that would be very handy. Most of the pa passages will be on the screen. All right. So let's begin. Um, well, Thank you for your patience. The expectations that God has laid before us in this study this morning are those of Eli, the father of his two sons and the priests, and the priesthood itself, which we looked at briefly last week, and then the Lord's expectations. And I think we'll get into something um, very interesting this morning, one is the obedience that follows faith, and you all know about that, and you're working on it daily, and you're not perfect. And then there are the consequences that your father and your mother first taught you that there were consequences to disobedience. The Lord is serious about sin. The boy Samuel is now with Eli. And you might recall from 1 Samuel 2, verses 11 and following, that Hannah has now given her son, the boy Samuel, at about three years old, into the care of Eli, the priest. And the Lord's expectation for Eli is that he will train up Samuel to be a prophet and a judge. And that's going on all the time, uh, from the time that Samuel arrives and serves the Lord. But Eli's two sons unfortunately, have failed to meet both the Lord's and their father's expectations, as we have seen and will see today. They are becoming wicked, and they remain unbelieving disappointments to the father, and most of all to the Lord. Now, Eli is a Levitical priest, and we're going to take a look briefly at what God has established for those who lead or who led Israel as priests. And this is, um, as I said last week, uh, not a job. It's a calling. And in this case, it is inherited. Priests serve the Lord in the tabernacle, which is a, a tent-type uh, structure at this point, and later in the temple. And they serve the people who come to worship and sacrifice the Lord. There is a, a relevance between the priest of the Old Testament and those who serve at the altar as pastors in the church. We're not making that correspondence today, but it could be made. And we will talk just a little bit, if we have time, about priests in the New Testament. If you want to look at the Levitical priesthood, you have to start with Levi, the third son of Leah and Jacob. We find out that they didn't get one of the territories, uh, provinces, because no land or inheritance was given to Levi and his descendants. Why not? The Lord said, the priesthood itself and the Lord are your inheritance. The Lord assigned 48 cities, including the surrounding pasture land in each of, around each of those cities, for the Levites. Now, he realized that they were, their main source of income was 
the sacrifices that the Lord had permitted them to eat after the sacrifice had been made. The Lord scattered the Levites amongst the cities in the other tribes' lands. They didn't have a land of their own. If you look up the word priest in the Old Testament, you find out that it is used many times. The Hebrew word is kohen. The plural of the word is kohanim. It's used 70, 748 one times in the Old Testament, and one third of those times, this is things, uh, these are things you don't need to know. But you realize what is happening that in the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that is the main source of the teaching on the priest. One third of those times they're there, and the other times they're the priest as they practice. In the book of Le Leviticus, which is sometimes called the manual for priests. It's used 185 times. And if we had time, we could look up an article I read a few weeks ago uh, about the name Cohen, which you know is a very common surname for Jewish people today. And some of those people believe that they can trace their lineage all the way back to the Levitical priesthood. I don't know how they do that, but you know, they kept records. To talk about the Levitical priesthood is to realize that this is something the Lord gave. Just as he gives pastors to the church today, he gave priests to Aaron and his descendants the call to serve in the tabernacle and later in the temple. The Lord chooses those who will come near to him. I'm going to pause and let you consider that. Uh, I'm going to pause and let you consider that as I look at the, uh, the full screen here. Anybody want to chime in, ask a question, comment? We're here for you. Anybody? Not now. Nope. Okay. Not now. Okay, we'll go back. Hi, Linda. Hi there. How are you, Jeannie? Good. Good to see Hi, you. Hi, Jeannie. All right. Hi. So the Lord makes his choice, just as he does today. And that, that is always a problem. That we, when we do that, uh, we lose that. Okay. So then the book of Exodus records this. I would like someone to read that passage from Exodus 28, please. And bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests. Aaron and Aaron's son, uh, Nad, 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 Nadab, 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 Abihu, Ahab, and uh, Eliezer, and oh. Ith Ithamar. This shall be a statue forever for him and for his offspring after him. Sometimes I wish we had an Old Testament filled with modern name so that we could read it easily. But then the meaning of the name would be lost. The Levitical priesthood had as the main duty of the priest to sacrifice on the altar the offerings that the people brought. And they are extensive and many and for different reasons. We don't have time to study that today. They made, the priest did, intercession. They prayed for the people. They brought the petitions of the people in general and in particular to the Lord. And they were to be teachers of the law. So they knew the law. Good morning. The high priest was the only one permitted in the Holy of Holies, as you know, on the Day of Atonement, when he would take the blood of the sacrifice and sprinkle it first upon the altar and then upon the people. It is hard for us to understand the Old Testament priesthood. And we can study it and study it, but it's so foreign. To, the culture is so foreign to us 3,000 years later. The high priest could deliver edicts to guide the nation as well. That is, that is a rare occurrence. Then there were Levites who were not priests. Only the Levites descended from Aaron, as we said before. 
could become priest. Kohanim is the plural. The Levites, referring to those who were not Kohanim, were specifically assigned to service in the tabernacle, and then later in the temple, of course, when it was built. What did the Levites do? I want you to think of the present day church as you realize what these people did. And you can, you can realize immediately the, the equivalents in today's church. The Levites sang and they played instruments and they took care of furnishings and they guarded the tabernacle. How many people does it take to, to support pastor in all of the duties and callings that surround him in the service of our church. Not just for the worship service, but uh, we could add uh, bookkeepers and, and supervisors and teachers. The, the list is very long and the larger the church, the more people who are involved as though they were Levites in uh, small you know, permanent. Now, here's the thing that you should remember. All priests were Levites, but now all Levites were priests. Say it with me, please. All priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. And the delay due to the internet uh, makes it hard for us to do anything in unison. All right, I've learned that. The Levites who were not priests include, included Samuel. Now, he was a descendant of Levi, and therefore he was eligible to serve in the tabernacle. Everybody knew that. His mother knew that. His father knew that. Eli knew that, and he knew it eventually. But he was not a descendant of Aaron and therefore could not become a priest. Now, there were people in the Old Testament who occasionally did something belonging to the priest. Uh, sometimes they sacrificed and uh, they, they prayed and they were in the temple as uh, though they were a priest, but they were not Aaronic priests. Priests in the New Testament, I think you know uh, about these very well. You know, uh, when Jesus was getting closer and closer to his cross, there were the chief priests, Caiaphas and Annas, and they were instrumental in making sure that Jesus was crucified as they handed him over to the Gentiles, that is, to, uh, to Pontius Pilate. The Levitical priesthood was never in intended to be permanent. Maybe you didn't know that. But the book of Hebrews makes a great point, as we studied about eight years ago here. Remember that? Some of you were in that study. I know Judy was. We studied uh, Hebrews at length, verse by verse, and it took us months and months and months to get through it. But one of the great points that Hebrews makes is that Jesus Christ was greater than all of the Old Testament structures and people that pointed to him, that were types, and he's the antitype, the fulfiller. And so the, uh, the priesthood of Jesus was greater than all the priests of the Old Testament. And he replaced them. The death of Christ put an end to the Levitical priesthood. He was, as it says in that great hymn of the Lenten season, the victim and also the priest. He sacrificed himself. Can everybody say, for me? For me. For me, he died. Him. Let's talk about the, a little bit more about the priests in the Old Testament. Ever since his ascension into heaven, which we celebrated about two weeks ago Thursday, Jesus himself serves as the believer's great high priest. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have access into God's presence, whereby we can freely approach him. We do not have to go through anyone Jesus is the one mediator between God and man. He is the man, Christ Jesus. Now, did you know that you were a priest? You're not a pastor, but you are a priest. Could someone read Revelation 1, 5 and 6? 
To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us the kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He's made us a kingdom, priest to God, his God and Father. And this one from 1 Peter 2 9. Another reader, please. Oops. Anybody. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We don't have time to discuss at length the priesthood of all believers. You've heard that term, I'm sure. Let's go on. And this is really the main point that I need to establish for you and with you that God had high expectations of those he chose as priests. As I keep saying, this was not a job. This was God's high calling. Uh, reading from Leviticus 21, someone, use your voice today. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the Lord's food offerings the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. They shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who has been defiled. Neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband. For the priest is holy to his God. Now, thank you. See, that obscures, doesn't it? There's another passage from uh, from uh, chapter 21 of Leviticus, he shall not let the hair of his hair hang loose, and he's not supposed to tear his clothes. You remember when they were very angry, the priests in, in the Old Testament tore their their clothes mm -hmm. in anger? They weren't supposed to do that. They will take as their wife a virgin of their own people. And they had to be perfect. No blemishes, injuries, mutilations, or blindness. And you can read Leviticus 22 to get more of the requirements. This is stringent. Not everybody measures up. They must be a male, a descendant of Aaron, as we've already rehearsed. They must be between 30 and 50 years old. Now, you consider that. That's an early retirement age. After 50, they could still serve, but they couldn't be the priest and certainly not the high priest. Now, that age 30... Do you remember the passage in, uh, I believe it's the, uh, Luke's gospel, where it, Jesus was about the age of 30 when he began his ministry? There's a certain kind of, uh, I think, maturity that um, a young man attains. And before then, he is being trained and taught and given some uh, experience as an intern. We're still doing that, although we generally graduate men from the seminary at the earliest, around age 24, and some of us were older. They must be unblemished, not lame or blind. When I first typed that, I looked at it and I said, there's something wrong with the sentence. I had not lame or blonde. That's <laughs> <So>, <laughs> So, Thank you very much. Well, they, 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 they couldn't. Now you realize uh, the, their lineage coming from the uh, from um, from the Hebrews. There's very little likelihood that they would be blonde. We're not going into that. There's nothing intended. They must have a proper marriage. I can't imagine a, a priest, except uh, well, we're not going to go into that either. A divorced woman. Uh, not married to a widow, but they could marry a priest widow. widow. That's interesting. Uh, they must yeah. marry a virgin of their own people. Question? You can interrupt any time. I'm, um, I'm glad for a rest. Crawl is on now. <laughs> Pardon? I've been on all the time. They must have no uncleanness, no leprosy, uh, for example. They must have an untrimmed beard. 
all the all the people of the Old Testament when we did flannel graphs and when we had videos uh, for the Sunday school. Take a chair, uh, wherever. Yeah, yeah. well trimmed but unshaved hair. Uh, except during the coronavirus, and they couldn't go to the barber <laughs> and be properly dressed. So let's summarize God's high expectation. Holy, yep. without blemish, dedicating their entire lives to the Lord's service. They must be ceremonially clean. That is, they couldn't touch a dead body, and uh, they, uh, there are certain things they couldn't do with animals. Uh, there's high requirements. And in general, they have to be an example, just as uh, pastors in the New Testament are required to have uh, to set an example to God's people in their clothing and the family and actions their piety, their faith, their obedience. We all have a, a hard time measuring up. Now, uh, this is um, a, a warning that is different from last week. Last week at this point, they gave us a, a chance to keep on going. So we have a 10 minute warning. Let's see what we can do. As we read last week, Eli's sons did not measure up to God's expectations. The sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. We studied that last week and how they did that. They had no regard for the Lord. Some of the other translations say they did not know the Lord, and that's a statement that says they did not have faith in the Lord. They did not properly fear and love him, as the Old Testament commandment says. They use their office to take the sacrifices belonging to God for themselves. And they did it with impunity as far as they were concerned. They didn't know the judgment of the Lord was coming upon them. The sin of the young man was very great. They had no regard but used their offices, as I said, and sinned sexually with the women who were serving the Lord as singers or in other services in the tabernacle. You just kind of shudder, don't you, to know that not only did they, they uh, sin against the altar, but they sinned outside of the altar by having sex with women who were not their wives. God put his judgment on Eli's sons, who would not listen to the voice of their father. Now, here's the sentence that will give some of you trouble. It was the will of the Lord to put them to death. We're going to study that, so your trouble should um, be resolved if I do my work in the next uh, oh, 12 minutes. Or, I mean, uh, well, it wasn't 12 minutes. The Lord's judgment falls upon the sons of Eli, and there are two questions that I want to address with you. First, how are we to understand the son's refusal to hear their father's correction? And then we, if we have time, we'll get to the second question, which is, how are we to understand, and this is the part that troubles you, it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. But don't get ahead of me. Hmm. This is important. And it's important not for studying the Old Testament, but the importance for people who are alive in the world today, as we look into the mirror and as we look at other people in the world and the mirror of the television set. God's judgment fell on Eli's sons. How are we to understand their refusal to hear the, God, uh, the Lord's correction? Paul is telling us in one of his letters that the will of the Lord or the things of the Old Testament were, were written for our instruction, so that the will of the Lord has not changed. Here's a rhetorical question for you. You can answer it if you want. Is the Lord serious about sin? Yes. You all say yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Think of Revelation. <laughs> that, that these sons would not listen. You hear the will there? They would not. It wasn't that they were deaf. Amy. They refused to listen as a sin against the what commandment? 
Third? All right, Catechism 101. What commandment is it that requires them to listen to their father? Well, thou shalt honor your, your father, or your father and your mother. That's the what, fourth, fourth? fourth commandment. So number four, they did not accept Eli's correction. What other commandments were disobeyed? Love you, God, with all your heart. Well, when you, oh, James says when you disobey one commandment, you disobey all of them. All right. And they disobeyed the first commandment because they did not even believe in the Lord. The yeah. third commandment, their worship was corrupted. You've got the fourth commandment. Also, you go to the seventh oh. commandment. They were, they were stealing the Lord's offering for themselves. And then they were coveting that which did not belong to them. I, I, I think we have an indictment. I think we have committed adultery, an adultery, an adultery. Oh, I forgot number six. Yes. So that refusal to hear their father was a sign that their hearts were set against the Lord. It was hardened. It's the sin, which is bad enough, plus the refusal to repent. Now you see, it compounds it. Now I'm going to have to end our re. Our, our session today. I am very sorry about that. And, um, and it just the way the, the, the time goes, unless, uh, unless we buy um, uh, the full version of it. So I thank you for joining. For joining. Me, and I'm going to ask you to come again next Saturday at 10 o'clock. And we'll uh, do the rest of the study that I had prepared for this morning. Lord God, uh, preserve us in your word so that we not only know it, but fasten it to our heart and believe it. And then with your Holy Spirit's urging and prompting, obey the Lord in all our ways. We bring our sins to Jesus, our Savior from all of this sin, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.